thank you very much everybody for coming. Uh, the topic of tonight's conversation is going to be now and forever British, French and American soldiers on the Western Front in 1918. Now, <clears throat> before I start getting into the actual content, I always like to try and recommend some books that might be of interest to people on the kind of the wider topic around what I'll be talking about. Um, some of these may well be fairly familiar to you. Um, for example, is Elizabeth Greenhall's Victory Through Coalition, which is possibly one of my favourite books about the First World War. It's almost, to my mind, uh, required reading for understanding how the, the coalition of the Entente Cordiale worked, particularly on the Western Front um, throughout the First World War. Um, and a lot of what I talk about in regards to 1918 tonight, you'll find even more interesting bits and pieces in her book um, about it. Similarly, when we get to uh, talking about the, the end of the war and the immediate aftermath, um, Margaret McMillan's book, The Peacemakers, about the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, is just a wonderful, fabulous book. Um, and everybody should own a copy and, and read a copy um, if you get the opportunity to do so. I'm also contractually obliged on behalf of a variety of my friends and colleagues to mention that whilst I will be largely talking about Britain, France and um, America, there were more than just them fighting in the Entente Alliance and in and around the Western Front. So if you're interested in the Belgian army, for example, uh, Mario Draper's book is very, very good indeed. And Van der Wilcox's Italy in the Era of the Great War is also a superb book. Um, and she's a superb historian as well. So very much worth looking into those. Now, for the general structure for tonight, I'm going to divide this up into three uh, semi-equal parts to deal with the various aspects of Allied relations in 1918. So to begin with, we're going to discuss collapse in part one, and then we're going to discuss uh, victories in part two, followed eventually by disintegration um, as the war comes to an end. Um, so let us begin with a collapse in not simply Allied relations, but also the setup of the Western Front in 1918. Now, the victory of Germany on the Eastern Front over Russia in 1917 and the signing of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty um, very early in 1918 effectively resulted in two things. Firstly, a lot of German soldiers throw an enormous party on the Eastern Front because they've won their war. Um, they've won their battle. It's the most significant victory um, in a strategic sense um, in, in the war in years. Um, and it allows Germany to begin shipping huge numbers of men towards the Western Front to force a conclusion with the Allies to the West. So between uh, the 1st of November um, 1917 and the 21st of March 1918, Eastern Front divisions fall from 85 to 47 for the Germans. Um, the Western Army numbers on the 21st of March are 136,618 officers and 3.4 million men. Uh, Germany now outnumbers Allied divisions by 191 to 178. The outcome of this new manpower superiority is the opening of the German spring offensives, particularly uh, Operation Michael on 21st of March 1918. And here's a, a little map that will show you um, some of the aspects of this. Now, Germany attacks or the attacks begin at 4.40 a.m. on the 21st of March. Um, over the course of five hours, the Germans fire in the region of three million shells on Allied positions, particularly falling in and around Saint Quentin um, in an attempt to drive the British and the French armies apart and overrun Allied trenches on the Western Front. The Germans are assisted in this effort by an incredibly heavy fog, which makes it almost impossible for British and French defenders in those trenches to see much further than six to 10 feet away. Um, German soldiers come out of the fog directly in front of them. They drop into Allied trenches and British positions in particular are overrun. In fact, 225 square kilometres are overrun on the um, Allied sector in and around Saint Quentin and on that um, breach zone for Operation Michael just on the first day, which is an insane capture of space in a war that at times has been noted for its absence of grand captures and grand breakthroughs. Um, this was described by one historian as the unimaginable happening. Um, Western Front defences being breached on a scale and at a speed that had not yet been seen before in the duration of the war. 
The British, understandably in the face of this attack, begin to fall backwards, um, driven back by the German artillery, driven back by the fog, driven back by the German stormtroopers who attack their trenches. Word of this begins to spread throughout the Allied armies. Um, these are all quotations taken from letters written by French soldiers, um, drawn from the French postal censor records, which are held at an archive in Vincennes in France, all of them discussing French reactions to the British retreat from Saint-Quentin. So we have one soldier saying, um, the English soldiers whom we replace are absolutely disgusting, dirty, drunken, abandoning more equipment and ammunition than our men. Um, one soldier writes to his mother, although this letter was redacted, saying that the English bastards have not been able to stop the Germans without our intervention. So it is always the French who are the best cannon fodder. Um, and one French soldier described the English as being threatened with a careless disaster. Now, there are reasons behind these strength of feelings from the French that go beyond just being annoyed that the Western Front has given way. But to understand why the French react in this way, we also have to understand that an awful lot of allied relations between the British and the French are linked to particular places and particular circumstances. So the British and French who served together on the Somme in 1916 actually get along really pretty well together. It takes them a while to kind of warm up to each other. The, the French want a bit more than the British are capable of giving. The British want to learn a little bit more from the French <clears throat> to try and find some way of, of interacting with each other. But eventually in the Ransom they make it work. But that's not all that's happening on the Western Front. And an awful lot of important events take place outside of the view of the other ally. And in particular, two key moments for the French that have a dramatic impact on the way they react to the British retreat in 1918. The first of which is the ongoing fighting at Verdun in 1916. Now, the British, upon hearing about what the French are undertaking at Verdun, are in absolute awe. They think that the French defenders at Verdun and the French effort at Verdun is heroism of the highest order. British soldiers write in glowing terms about what the French are doing in Verdun. Newspapers print stories about the French valor at Verdun. What none of them really understand is that not only are the French fighting in um, fighting in, in a kind of a, a valiant manner at Verdun, they are also being effectively brutalized by the fighting there. With um, Pétain's Noria system, his, his water wheel system, of ensuring that virtually the entirety of the French army cycles through Verdun to spread the damage around, the entire French army undergoes this process of being radicalized, of being brutalized by the, by the fighting there, by the conditions there, by the fact that they're now locked in this attritional battle for the very safety and survival of France. It has a long-term effect. And that long-term effect begins to be seen at first during the French mutinies um, of 1917, uh, particularly during the Nivelle Offensive at the Commande d'Armes. Um, now, without going into details about all of the reasons why the, the, the mutinies take place, one of the key reasons behind French soldiers' decisions to effectively go on strike um, is that they don't believe that their own officers and their own country is respecting their rights enough as French citizens. They are wasting their lives on offensives that aren't going to work, when actually they should be preserving their lives for something that will potentially work. The bottom line of this is, the French soldiers and the French army itself begins to draw a line in the sand regarding what it is they are willing to accept from their own army, from their own generals. So you can draw a straight line from 1916 at Verdun to the Commande d'Armes. You can also therefore draw a second line from Verdun to the Commande d'Armes to the French mindset in 1918. If the French aren't willing to accept incompetence or cowardice or failure from their own army officers, they are absolutely no longer willing to accept it from their own allies. When the British break at Saint-Quentin during Operation Michael and they begin to fall back, 
the French response to it is born out of a desperate anguish. How could you do this to us? After everything that we've been through, we fought for 10 months at Verdun, we fought together at the Somme, we went on strike in 1917. After all of these moments, after all that we've suffered, you're running away now and we're going to potentially lose the war because you wouldn't stand and fight. And therein you begin to see the, the formation of the cracks between the British and the French armies on the Western Front, that the French believe that the British are running away that they are jeopardizing everything that they have jointly suffered for, and the French are going to be the ones who pay the price for it. Now, obviously the outcome, or one of the outcomes of the German spring offensives, is that eventually, in the immediate aftermath, the um, Allied forces decide that actually it might be a good idea to maybe put someone in charge, a guy in charge who would be the supreme commander of the Allied armies, someone who could come up with a kind of a cohesive strategy. It wouldn't necessarily have to be a case of, you know, the British are going to do their thing and the French are going to do their thing and the Italians are going to do their thing. Somebody actually at the top of the pyramid. Um, there are two potential candidates for this. One is uh, Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who had fought um, repeatedly throughout the war, had been um, key in defences and the offences of 1914, had been in charge of French armies around the Somme in 1916. Um, or Philippe Pétain, um, who had been in charge of the defence of Verdun for a period of time in 1916. Now, there were a variety of reasons why they picked the one that they did. One of the reasons that has often been summed up is that Ferdinand Foch was a very optimistic man and Philippe Pétain was not. So faced with two men, one of whom said, we can absolutely do this, and one of whom said, I don't know if we can do this, they picked the one who seemed most optimistic. Now, in writings after the war, um, Marshal Douglas Haig has come to suggest that he was the one who suggested that Foch should be given Allied command, particularly in the knowledge that Lloyd George would never support him being made Allied commander. And as the French army was the largest army on the Western Front, they should be uh, placed in charge. Um, in her own research um, into the events of the conference that decided who was gonna become the Supreme Commander of the Allied armies, Elizabeth Greenhall discovered and effectively published that when Haig said all of those things, he was lying um, after the fact. Um, and a lot of the French um, representatives at the conference were not particularly pleased that the British were trying to claim credit for putting a Frenchman in charge, nor were the French particularly pleased that the British seemed to now be walking around with a mentality that, yes, we may have retreated from Saint-Quentin, but it would have been even worse if the French had been in charge there. Um, one of the interesting aspects that comes out of these spring offensive collapses is that the British soldiers, particularly on the ground, don't realize quite the damage that is being done to their reputation in the eyes of the French. Part of that is understandable. When you're running for your life, you don't really care too much what the neighbors think of you. But within British high command, there was beginning to become a bit of a feeling that the French might be souring on the British quite severely. And Colonel Eric Dillon um, wrote effectively that in his own memoirs, that the feeling that French haven't done their fair share of this battle is very prevalent. On the other hand, I have no doubt that the French say that our troops ran away from Saint Quentin. And he's very perceptive because the French troops absolutely said that the British troops ran away from Saint Quentin. So the British and the French now have a slight problem. The British are retreating, though that eventually will be arrested. Um, the French are rapidly losing faith in their principal ally um, in the British, the ally who's been with them the longest. Ordinarily, this is a problem that doesn't necessarily have an easy solution. However, by this point in 1918, there is an easy solution. The French can hitch their cart to a different horse if they so choose to. When America declares war in 1917, the The United States existed effectively as potential, not as a ready-made army ready to go, because the American army doesn't exist at this point, effectively. It's been a while running around in circles in Mexico, but they're not about to land with several million men to win the war. Uh, some historians have, have said, and I agree with them, actually, that American neutrality actually extended 
the length of the war, um, particularly because it was a fairly one-sided neutrality. They still traded with the British and the French, but they couldn't trade with the Germans. And the longer that America existed as a prize to be won for the Allies, the longer the war would continue. Um, but when America does enter the war, Britain and France launch a fairly kind of rapid charm offensive to try and make sure that they get the best deal out of the Americans. When the British arrive in America and in Washington, they note that they're greeted reasonably warmly, but there is a noted and a notable difference to how the French are being welcomed. The French send uh, Joseph Joffre, um, the uh, man of the miracle on the Marne from 1914, to go on a charm offensive to um, America, and it works. Um, Joffre and the French contingent are very good at winning over American support, partly because they have this shared Republican history, which is very interesting and very useful, but will become a problem for one of the other allies as the war goes on. But also, the Americans are kind of fairly suspicious of the British, partly for kind of pre-war strategic reasons, but also the Americans kind of partly blame the British for losses of shipping in the Atlantic from German U-boats because of the stringent controls of the British um, naval blockade that they believe may have forced Germany to begin un, um, unrestricted U-boat warfare. One of the key things that the British and the French both want is American soldiers, but they don't necessarily want an American army. They want American soldiers to be drafted directly into their own armies. It's called the Amalgamation Plan. The Americans are not keen on this at all. Uh, Woodrow Wilson isn't keen on it. Uh, Pershing isn't ke uh, keen on it. They basically make the argument that if anybody is going to be um, commanding American soldiers in the field, it should be an American. It should be an American army, an American expeditionary force. Now, on the way over to America, Joffre had already informed the French that he didn't think the Americans would go for the amalgamation plan. He said that no country that aspired to greatness would ever agree to the conditions that Britain and France hoped to be put on them. Which means that when America rejects the amalgamation plan, Joff's already ready with a brand new, better idea. And he says, oh, absolutely. You know, you should have an American expeditionary force. But how about this? How about if about 90 to 95 percent of your army come over to France, train up in our army to get used to things? And then when the time comes, you can be your own cohesive force. And the Americans like this idea a lot. And by the time the British realize what's happening, the deal's already been done. And it's great news for the French. They get to temporarily replace all of their losses with brand new arriving American recruits. American re recruits get to be trained up by the French and eventually have this opportunity to serve as our own allied army. To get to this point, the Americans are going to need to be trained, though. Here's a map of the various um, American training camps for um, American soldiers during the First World War. Um, in an ideal world, in a sensible world, the training would have been done by both the British and the French, but it would have been focused around things that they were particularly good at. So, for example, maybe the French would have taken the artillery training predominantly, and the British may have taken armoured training or things along those lines. Um, that's not really how it panned out. Um, it was a bit of a mishmash. There's no real clear record of why some people were trained in particular ways, why some people were trained by the French, why some people were trained by the British. But American soldiers kind of watched their training with an element of bemusement because it was often weirdly contradictory. Uh, so Colonel Frederick M. Wise here says, the British at the time were crazy about the bayonet and they knew it was going to win the war. The French were equally obsessed with the grenade. They knew it was going to win the war. So we also got a full dose of training in hand grenade throwing. You get a British trainer would arrive, train you in something. He would then leave. A French trainer would arrive, potentially contradict everything the British trainer would just taught you, train you in something else, and then he'd leave. It was very difficult for the Americans to know what it was that they were supposed to be learning. Um, in and amongst this, the British discovered that a lot of the Americans were staggeringly naive in regards to interactions between um, various, nation, uh, various nations and various uh, combatants. Um, after a while, American soldiers in their writings, and again spoken out loud, begin to refer to the French as frogs. They don't do this 
before they have a prolonged contact with British soldiers. Um, and in my mind, I always have this very weird situation play out of a group of American soldiers come up to two British soldiers and they say, oh, you know, we're going to meet the French next week and we really, really want to make a good impression. So any tips that you can give us on how to, you know, ingratiate ourselves with the French and how to make us make them like us, we'd be so grateful. And these two British soldiers look at each other for a minute and then go, you should call them frogs. They absolutely love that. Don't take no for an answer now. Trust us, call them frogs and those, and those French soldiers will love you for the rest of their lives. And to an extent, that's partially what happens. In and amongst this, when we, American soldiers start traveling across the, um, the Atlantic to arrive in Britain and then arrive in Europe, there is friction between them and the British. There are reports of fights repeatedly in Liverpool and the like. Some American soldiers are given a lecture on how to get along with the British. Um, and they're warned with um, a restriction of their leave if they cannot find a way to be courteous to each other. Over the duration of 1918, American forces begin to arrive en masse on the Western Front. So at the outbreak of the German Spring Offensive, there weren't actually that many Americans in France. There's 284,000 of them. By July, it's a million. By November the 2nd, it's 1.8 million. And at times there were 10,000 Americans arriving in France every single day. That is a number that effectively the Germans can't kill fast enough. Um, the Americans, even if they're not fully trained, is a, a, a weight of manpower that is going to cause serious problems for Germany's ability to win on the Western Front. But all is not well between the Americans and particularly their British allies. Uh, Leonard van Nostrand, um, whilst staying um, in Britain, eventually having been patronised and insulted and laughed at and joked at, loses his temper in his memoirs and describes Britain as a decadent nation that's 50 years behind the times and so damn dumb they don't know it, but they are good fighters and courageous people. The ordinary English does not lack courage. He's fairly intelligent, selfish, a tightwad, always wants to fill his stomach, hard drinker and not too well educated, but a fine fellow to hold a lady's hand and stand around a drawing room. The Scotch are bully. We cannot say too much for the Scotch. Best fighters, best everything. Now, this last part is a significant problem for the British because, or to put it more simply, for the English. The Americans don't like the English. They do like the Scottish, they do like the Irish, and they also like the Australians. And when talking to all of them, they gain the appearance or the view that the British are patronising, superior, condescending, and will not hesitate to put them in the front line first to die and keep themselves back. Now, regardless of whether or not that is true, this is the view that a lot of American soldiers begin to gather. From the British point of view, imagine them now stood on the sidelines, staring at um, Americans, sitting down drinking with Scottish, Irish and Australian soldiers, getting along just fine and dandy. Here's a nation that's now incredibly wealthy and powerful and got that way by throwing off the yoke of imperial op oppression. Now discussing exactly that with the Scottish, the Irish and the Australians, what could possibly go wrong in the minds of the British as they watch this play out? So coming back from the other direction, the British start to look down on the, on the Americans as effectively having been infected by too much, too much democracy, infected by too much freedom. They're contemptible, they're inefficient and ill-disciplined, and as ordinary human beings to associate with, they're terrible. They were the sweepings of the city of New York, which appeared to me to mean the sweepings of Middle Europe and Russia. The sacred flame of democracy burned high in every breast and manifested itself in the grossest contempt of orders and the filthiest abuse in audible terms if one tried to enforce a necessary military order. The British think the Americans can't be ordered around. They don't have a military mindset. They also think they're a little bit nouveau riche. You know, you've come over here with your money and your fancy music and your fancy ways and you don't know how we do things here. There's an order to things. There's a natural order of Europe, which you are now disrupting. 
It doesn't help that they're also getting along quite well with the French. Um, at repeated points in uh, 1917 and in 1918, the French and the Americans throw parties, for example, the 4th of July. Huge parties between French and American soldiers to celebrate America's Independence Day. There's singing, there's drinking, there's fireworks, and off to the side is a lot of British soldiers looking at them to basically say, you guys are dicks. You do see that we're stood right here, don't you? The way you have your massive party to celebrate overthrowing us. Maybe, maybe stow it until after the war, perhaps. So these things are ticking along in the background and will eventually begin to blossom into something a little bit more um, serious. Before this, however, we begin to see with the checking of the German spring offensives and the eventual Allied counterattacks, the beginnings of the Allied victory. Now, one of the moments that comes of kind of early American involvement in a, in a particular battle and of Allied cooperation comes in the Battle of Le Hamel on the 4th of um, July, 1918. Largely organized by Generals Manash and Rawlinson, but also making use of the sec of two companies of the 131st and two companies of the 132nd US Infantry, alongside Australian soldiers. Now, in the lead up to this battle, Manash in particular is very keen on using these soldiers because they're right there, they're, they're with him and they'll be super useful for supporting the attack. General Pershing catches wind of this and lets it be known that American soldiers will absolutely not be ordered into combat by British generals, that you are not to use them under any circumstances. Manash, realizing that if he doesn't do this, the attack probably won't take place and will falter, ignores Pershing and goes ahead and does it anyway. Um, the battle is a success, the position is taken, and Pershing stands on the sidelines and seethes with annoyance. This is everything he really wanted to avoid. American soldiers being subsumed into another army, sent into battle by another country, by other generals who may not necessarily take good care of their soldiers, and to make it worse, it's the British. On the 8th of August at 4.20 in the morning, uh, the Allies launched their major counterattack on the Western Front at the Battle of Amiens. Um, utilizing infantry and tanks. They advanced by eight miles in the mid-afternoon, uh, by nine, uh, it's another four miles by the 9th of August, and by the 11th of August, the battle is shot down. Um, the Allies sustained fairly light casualties, all things considered, 22,000 men. Um, Germans sustained 75,000 casualties, but crucially, 50,000 of them are prisoners of war. This is uh, Ludendorff's black day for the German army, not because of the ground that's lost, not necessarily even because of the casualties sustained, but because of the fracturing of hope within the German army. The German army begins to realize after this point that they're probably going to lose the war. The Germans realize this long before the Allies realize that they're about to win it. Um, in the aftermath of Amiens, you begin to see other breakout battles involving Allied forces or particular national um, armies. Throughout their training, and throughout conversations with the British and the French, a lot of British and French generals worried about the Americans because they taught them all that they knew, they told them how trench warfare worked, they told them how the balance of power worked and how to interact and how to fight a battle in 1917 and 1918. And throughout this time period, they had this nagging fear that the Americans were just nodding along saying, yep, whatever you say, and when given the opportunity to do what they wanted to, they'd ignore everything that they'd been told. And it turns out they were absolutely right. There are two key battles for the Americans um, from September onwards. There's the Battle of Sammy Hill, which is a tremendous American success. It's full of kind of all the things that General Pershing has ever wanted. Um, it's full of gusto and aggression and esprit de corps and elan and they storm German positions and they capture the field and the French who are alongside them and the, the rest of the French army think it's the most amazing thing. This fabulous, uh, energetic, aggressive American army has arrived and look at this, they're smashing German positions. This is fantastic. They're loads better than the British are. Then you have the battle at Meuse Argonne, which drags on and the Americans suffer incredibly high casualties over the course of the battle, largely because they're effectively reproducing 
tactics from 1914 and 1915. Um, they get bogged down in barbed wire, they get bogged down by machine guns and artillery, um, and the Americans struggle, and they lose a lot of men in doing it. And the British and the French, even though the French are still kind of enamoured with this aggressive spirit of the American army, begin to wonder whether or not this was a very good idea to put them in charge of themselves if they're just going to waste their own lives. Now, eventually, um, the Allies come right up to the, uh, the Western Front, uh, the, uh, the Hindenburg Line on the Western Front, and begin to storm it in September 1918. And um, American soldiers under the command of the British, again, storm tunnels in and around Bonny um, and near Bellicourt. Um, and the Allies stormed the Hindenburg Line, eventually smashed through it, opened up a huge um, gap in it by the end of September 1918. And finally, it looks like victory is now at hand. At the same time, serious cracks are beginning to appear, not between the British and the Americans, who still don't like each other particularly, but between the, the Americans and the French. And a lot of this exists around African-American soldiers as well. Now, the Americans have not been particularly keen on having African-Americans in the army at all, but they decided, you know, needs must when the, when the, uh, the muster was taking place. Um, as soon as those African-Americans arrived in France, huge numbers of them, effectively all of them, are just given away to the French. The Americans don't want them. They send them off to the French to try and solve a problem for themselves. The French whilst not being like a post-racist society in 1918 by any means, have a very different interaction with race, even with their own kind of imperial and colonial troops, than the Americans do. Um, and they watch how white Americans treat black Americans and are horrified, effectively. Um, Rich Fogarty's written a very good book on this called Race and War in France, um, and he reports a story of Blaise Diagnier, um, who was a black deputy from Senegal um, in, the, uh, in the French government, who was appalled upon hearing that um, the American army had sent um, a letter to the French asking them not to praise black soldiers in front of white Americans, not to make them stand near each other, not to treat them particularly well. All of these things which seemed completely counter to Republican ideology. How can you call yourself democratic? How can you call yourself Republicans if you treat people in this way? And the cracks from there begin to appear. Beyond this, the French also begin to hear word of what Woodrow Wilson had in plan for the peace conference and the eventual peace treaty with Germany, and they are not impressed. Uh, one French soldier writes that the demand addressed by Germany to President Wilson is a pure insult to England and France. England reappearing in the mind of the French because of the fact that they've been in it for so long. Um, for one week in October, um, there were 173 letters sent from men in the 4th Art French Army. Now, these were men who had raved about the Americans at Sammy Howe and had fought alongside them at Meuse Argonne. And of those 173 letters that discussed the armistice, 137 of them in a single week were anti-President Wilson and spoke with critical nature about what he had planned for the peace. French soldiers write about how pleased they are with the, with the Americans, but they're not interested in, in America turning up and stealing their victory from them and then telling them all what it meant. When the end of the war comes, and it comes quite quickly, surprisingly quickly for many of the Allies, the facade of Allied cooperation begins to disintegrate. The end of the war itself, the final day, is a complicated day in itself. Um, men of the 5th Marine Regiment had been walking through fog in the early hours of the morning. They had been heavily shelled for days beforehand from German positions and um, in the darkness, two German soldiers suddenly stumble out in front of them and the Americans open fire. They kill one outright and one lies on the floor and screams up to them, comrade, please, I'm dying, please help me. And they walk around him and they leave him behind. It's 3 a.m. 
on the 11th of November 1918. The signing of the armistice is mere hours away. Now, the reason they leave him behind is probably multifaceted. The bombardment they'd received in the previous days had caused heavy casualties and um, a lot of ill feeling amongst those men. However, at the same time, a lot of American soldiers during their training have been told, do not take German prisoners. They're not to be trusted. Better to bayonet them, shoot them, or simply leave them to die. And it was the British who told them to do that. Um, the final day of the war um, sees around 10,944 men become casualties, of whom 2,738 die. Um, the Armistice Declaration itself and the end of the war is initially greeted, greeted with huge celebrations um, by Allied soldiers drinking together and singing together and partying together. They sing each other's national anthems. Here, Lance Corporal Abraham in the British Army writes about um, finding uh, two French soldiers, each with a girl on his left arm, um, whilst urinating in a gutter. All of them are drunk and they're singing. And it's a magnificent party. But that's just the 11th of November. The removal of Germany from the Allied equation also removes a lot of the reasons why these people should get along at all. You can cooperate with people you don't particularly like if you're fighting a war and if there's still an enemy to fight against. But when that enemy is gone, you don't really need to like them anymore. You certainly don't need to cooperate with them anymore. And surprisingly quickly, the will start to come off. Private Robert Cude reports um, having to listen to the abuse of the British that even Jerry would not use. Um, and this is of the Americans. In return, they have a little to listen to and I get some troops home, especially the fact that the whole of the prisons of New York must have been emptied to fill the ranks of this division. Again, I run through the fact that there is not one but that has more than a little German blood in him and not a little German sentiment. There have been stories previously of Americans and British uh, particularly English, fighting in Liverpool. They begin fighting in France too. Um, a British soldier is stabbed through the net with a bayonet by an American soldier in a bar fight. Um, in response, British soldiers tired an American soldiers behind the lorry and drag him through a town. Um, violence begins to flare up where British and American soldiers interact with each other because they don't have to get along anymore. There is nothing keeping them allied within an alliance. It's not just issues between the British and the Americans either. If we think back to that charming story of um, Americans calling the French frogs, well, they don't stop throughout 1918. They continue to do it to the French face, uh, to the faces of the French soldiers. Eventually, the French begin to lose patience with it. Uh, Frank Palmer Silbley here says that our men early began calling the French frogs. This invariably hurt and is a factor in the thing that happened at the very end a distinct lessening of the mutual regard between the French and the Americans. In the beginning, we seemed to be liked better than the English were, and they were. After Americans stemmed the tide of the German offensive at the Second Battle of the Marne, our popularity was something marvellous. But towards the end, and especially after the end, there were mutual complaints. The French don't want to put up with being called frogs anymore. The Americans still want to be able to have fun, but they also still want to be praised for the sacrifices they've made recently made. The French don't want to praise someone who seems to be stealing their victory from them, and the whole thing begins to continue to unravel. The complaints begin to mount up in all directions. The Americans complain about the way that the French are treating German prisoners and German civilians. The French complain that the Americans are treating German prisoners and civilians too lightly. They're not making them pay for the crimes they have committed against France. The Americans then complain that it's all well and good saying that, you know, we should treat them harshly, but French units are setting up black markets in occupied Germany and with German prisoners of war to start exchanging things. You, you can't complain to us about not treating them harshly enough whilst you're paying them for the stuff that they've scavenged up. Um, British and French um, soldiers in prisoner of war camps um, begin to demand to be let home. Um, French soldiers demand that a, um, a, a hut in one of these camps 
is broken down for firewood to help heat um, their own uh, huts. The Germans in charge refuse and the French riot. Um, the Germans open fire with live ammunition and drive them all back to a nearby football pitch where the British prisoners of war are having a football match and several British soldiers are shot and killed. The British blame the French for it. Um, the French blame the Germans for it. Um, the Americans now, you know, secure in the fact that the war has been won, get slightly concerned about how well African-American soldiers have been treated by the French. They've gotten along very well. They've won medals. They've been incorporated into the French army. They've fought battles. They've been treated with a degree of respect. Many African-American soldiers write that they've been treated by French soldiers better than anybody in their own country had ever treated them. The Americans had not given these American, African-American soldiers away to have them emancipated and filled with confidence. So when these African-American soldiers begin heading towards ships on the French coast to be taken home, American military police begin beating them with sticks. They split their heads open to try and knock the confidence out of them before they get on ships to go back to America. They don't want them taking this emancipated, emasculated power away from France and back to America. And these animosities just linger and fester within Allied ranks. It's not necessarily helped by the ongoing issues at the Paris Peace Conference. Here we have the world's first boy band with uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, uh, Clemenceau, uh, Lloyd George and Vittorio Orlando, um, each in charge of, um, kind of uh, the four main allies um, of the uh, Western Front. Um, the French are desperate for British and American support in hobbling Germany to ensure that France will be safe going forwards. America isn't interested in a vindictive or what they term to be a vindictive peace um, when the, there's an opportunity to kind of introduce democracy and republicanism to Germany. Um, the British are aware that they um, have almost bankrupted the country and they need to be able to trade with people in the post-war years and trading with a rebuilding Germany might be quite good for them. And none of them can reconcile these national interests and these national positions with any form of allied feeling. Um, Lloyd George would later write when asked about how he thought he'd gotten on at um, the Paris Peace Conference by saying that he thought he did rather well, considering that when he was sat between Clemenceau and Woodrow Wilson, he had, um, he had Jesus Christ on one side and I think Attila the Hun on the other. Um, there is a treaty, there is a form of agreement, it's spoken out about repeatedly. Um, just before the treaty is uh, signed, there is a large gathering of the major delegates. Um, most of them haven't read it yet because it hasn't been translated out of French, so it's going to be read out loud. Um, Marshal Foch uh, stands up and makes an impassioned plea that um, the Rhineland, the Rhine must be the border. It has to be the safe place for France now. Um, any defence of France has to begin at the Rhine. And Clemenceau shouts at him and he screams at him and tells him to sit down and go, what are you doing, sir? Why would you say these things? And we already have an agreement. And Foch replies that he is attempting to salve his own conscience. Nobody is getting what they want out of this treaty. When the Victory Parade marches through Paris in 1919, standing on the balcony looking down at it is the various Allied leaders who can barely stand to look at each other. Now, such is the misfeeling, the ill feeling, the animosity that's bubbled up within them. Um, marching through the streets of Paris, French soldiers are cheered by the French crowds. There's some cheering for the British. Some people in the crowd boo when the Americans walk past. They boo them for making it meaningless. This victory that we had, this opportunity to be safe, is rendered for nothing because of your leaders. So some French members in the crowd boo as American soldiers march past. General Victor Hugo, um, who writes um, a damning indictment of particularly of Britain in the aftermath of the war, basically lays all of 
the, the ill feeling of Versailles at the feet of the British for not backing up their long-standing French ally um, and frittering away the, the possibility of this alliance having worked in some way, shape or form. And at the end of the Victory Parade and at the end of the treaty, the French government basically holds an emergency meeting to discuss what's happened and what's going to happen next. And their overriding fear is that the British are now going to leave and the Americans are now going to leave. And when the Germans return one day, the British and the Americans will not. So how should we understand and frame this? Ally, this alliance that delivered victory, let's not forget, that you know it actually worked. When push came to shove in 1918, the British, the French and the Americans did actually manage to fight together. It's the victory itself that ironically unmakes the alliance. And there are a variety of ways that perhaps we can consider that. This is uh, the monument to the, to, the, to the dead in Calais, um, raised in the interwar years, and it's effectively a memorial or a monument to France being supported and aided by her allies. So the British are in there, the Americans are in there, the Italians are in there, the Portuguese are in there. This is a monument to the Entente Alliance. In France's moment of need, the allies delivered. This monument stood in Calais up until the Second World War. Calais falls during the German invasion and the occupation. And when Calais is eventually liberated, the monument is gone. The monument to allied cooperation, to allied feeling, to the alliance that won the First World War is destroyed by the war that it failed to adequately, in the minds of some, prevent from, from occurring later on. So is that what we should take from this alliance? Is that what we should take as the message from it, that this is an alliance that succeeds and fails by winning the war? Well, possibly so. But equally, there are lots of allied memorials. You just have to go and see them. You just have to know where to look. We talk, I mean, I say we, people within the sphere of First World War studies talk a lot about, you know, the Battle of the Somme and the memorial to the missing at Tietfel and the British effort on the Somme. But the French were there too, not simply at the battle, but they're there at the monument. Directly behind the monument at Tietfel is an allied cemetery. It contains the bodies of British soldiers and it contains the bodies of French soldiers. Because in the end, Britain and France went through this whole thing by themselves. The French may have dramatically called down on the British in 1918. They do warm up a little bit towards the end. Um, but there is an acknowledgement there, and even acknowledgement in the landscape now, that this was not a national effort. Victory on the Western Front was delivered by allied cooperation and allied sacrifice. And it didn't always work. And the times that it didn't work, it spectacularly didn't work. But it worked well enough to win the war within 1918. Now, if these are areas that I've been speaking about that tonight that are of interest to you and you want to kind of find out or read any more, then you can actually get hold of a copy of my book. I've managed to get a 20% off discount code from Palgrave. Now, there's an element to this, which is, even with a 20% off discount, which is nice, um, you might have to make a choice between buying a copy of my book and paying your mortgage. However, I have also been told today that um, the paperback version of my book is about to come live um, on the website. So I'd maybe give it a week if you're interested in buying a copy and then maybe looking to use the discount code on that. The starting price for that is £48. So you'll maybe get it down to about 40, 39 pounds. Again, I know that it's, it's, it's not cheap. It's, it's academic publishing. It is what it is. But if this has been of interest to you and you want to read any more, particularly about kind of early years of the war, why 1918 and the alliance pans out in the way that it does, then by all means, uh, use this discount code um, here. Just type that in when you get to the checkout um, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. But aside from that, I hope this has been fun and interesting for everybody. Uh, and thank you very much for, for taking part. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thanks ever so much indeed. Thank you um, very much. That was, uh, that was absolutely tremendous. Um, I know we've got... Um, Shall uh, I stop sharing some, my screen or do you need... Uh, to... Well, yeah, keep it up for the moment and then people can make a note of the discount yeah. code. Um, 
I might ask you to kill the, the screen um, later when, when we go into Q and A. Is it just might, might make life a little bit easier, but it's not 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 uh, doesn't matter one way or the other particularly. Um, right in uh, as, as I say in the best traditions uh, as we normally do. If everybody who enjoyed that would like to raise their hands as a sort of round of applause in these strange dark times, that would be tremendous. And that, Chris, you won't be able to see that I can nope. see a little, icon, <laughs> a little icon on the bottom, which is showing that everybody's raising their hands. So, so that's uh, that's the best we can do for a round of applause. But uh, thanks, everybody. Just just lower your hands now. That that's that's tremendous. Um, so, um, if uh, folk would like to ask the question uh, or questions, um, tap them in uh, on the Q and A thing. I, I, I'll just as I'm just sorting that out. I'm going to ask a question now, Chris. Um, just to give me a breathing space and time to, to organise the, uh, the, the the folk who are asking questions. What I'd ask, Chris, is um, that was terribly interesting. I, I know the f First World War is totally different from the Second, but we had obviously the same dynamics in the Second War with the French and the British and the Americans. What, did, the, did the same issues, notwithstanding, of course, that we weren't fighting alongside the Americans and French in... France, apart from the very end of the war, but did the same issues or totally different issues or no issues uh, occur in, in the Second World War? Um, I mean, the first thing I have to say is I've never probably, I haven't probably followed this into the to the Second World War. There are there are issues. I mean, you get that you know the idea that you know the Americans are you know oversexed and over here, and they appear looking fantastic with all their money and all this fanfare and all of this kind of confidence, and the British find that quite annoying um, at times. Um, what I would say in partial relation to it is I'm, I've got no doubt that a lot of your, the, the people watching here will um, have done so already. If you go to the, to the Musée d'Armée um, in Adonvalide in Paris and you go to the bookshop, it is full of books about America in the Second World War. There's very little stuff in there at all about Britain in anything really, but there's still this ongoing appreciation and memory of the efforts that America made to liberate France during the Second World War. So I don't think there's a, necessarily a huge amount of issue between the French and the Americans in that context. I think the British and the Americans continue to rub each other up the wrong way. Um, and the French don't care <laughs> about the British to an extent in uh, because, I mean, it's great that, you know, you let Charles uh, de Gaulle uh, set up a government here and all that type of stuff and that's you know that's all fantastic but yeah I just don't I don't think the, the French care that much about the British in the Second World War I might I might well be wrong on that I've not properly looked into the Second World War to be honest. Uh, that's brilliant Th thanks very much for that right so we've got um, um, some folk here now so let me just um, ask Tony Clatworthy if if you care to um, unmute Oh, right, we've got no sound. Ah. Right, Tony, Tony, uh, okay. T -t 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 Tony's thing, uh, point is just this. Uh, when Chris has completed, would, you, would it be possible to mention the name of the books again? So that, that's all, the, the uh, outset, I think, is what... Uh, oh, the outset? Yeah, yeah. Um, It was uh, Victory Through Coalition by Elizabeth Greenhall. It was uh, The Peacemakers by Margaret Macmillan. Um, it was The Belgian Army in the Great War by Mario Draper and Italy in the Era of the First World War by Vander Wilcox. But also all of those will appear on the YouTube video at the beginning of the slides and for the on the Facebook. So if, if I've got any of those names wrong, the, the real one, the real front cover will be up there. That's, per that's a perfect answer because you're quite right. Of course, it will when we go live on YouTube. Um, and indeed, because uh, it's also on Facebook as well, we don't have to wait for a couple of weeks on YouTube. Just go to the Greer Face Facebook page and you'll see the stuff that Chris was mentioning there. So that's fine. Right. Um, unmute. Glyn. Glyn Taylor. Um, I'm just asking you to unmute there. Glyn, um, can you... You're unmuted. You're live. Do you want to ask um, Chris your question? <laughs> So first of all, Chris, thanks for a really enthusiastic lecture. Really enjoyed it. Um, 
One of the most controversial aspects prior to the 21st of March was that the British um, took over 40 kilometers of line from the French. Now, this resulted in the um, Fifth Army having uh, three divisions in line in each corps, but only one in reserve. The uh, German deception plan, as far as I understand, was, a, uh, was an artillery feint against the uh, Chemin de Dam. Do, do you know what the setup of the French forces was on the Chemin de Dam? Was it, was it the same or was it two in the line, two in reserve or, or whatever? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I can't, I can't say for certain off the top of my head what it actually was. I suspect, my gut instinct is it's two and two. But if you want to know for certain, um, there's another book by Elizabeth Greenhull called The French Army in the First World War, um, which is again a superb book, um, which will have the answer. And if not, Robert Doughty's Pyrrhic Victory, which is also a wonderful book, will have so my instinct is two and two because that seems it seems more French it's <laughs> for, for whatever better term in regards to the first world war um but yeah I can't say for certain but but check that if you're if you want to if you want to nail it down uh, okay uh, thanks th thanks 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 for that thanks Glenn um Jeff um you, you're live uh do you want to Jeff Cunnington do you want to ask your question yes no thank you David thank you Chris a super talk really enjoyed it um, I've always been interested in the naval side of things in the First World War. So hearing you talk about the Americans and the, the English kicking lumps about each other in Liverpool, I wondered how they got up in Scotland with all the American naval personnel there when they were serving as part of the Grand Fleet and also constructing the Grand Barrage as well. Similar, I think, is the answer, to be honest. So um, there were it's very difficult at times sometimes to pin down whether or not the rumours relate to actual problems. Um, but I'm pretty sure that I have read that there were, there were issues between the British and the Americans in Scotland. Um, and that it, with all of these kind of flare ups in Liverpool or, or in other kind of ports and the like, there's always an element of, did this actually happen? But also all of the American British soldiers who read it go, well, yeah, of course they would. So there's this acknowledgement between American and British soldiers that even if these fights aren't actually happening, they probably would do because they just don't like each other enough. Yes, um, so I think you get a, a similar issue there, to be honest. Um, weirdly, though, what some Americans report is because a lot of the shipping that brings them across is obviously conducted by the Royal Navy and, and, and the British and the like. But also, obviously, a fair chunk of the Royal Navy is also made up of the Irish. So the Americans arrive on these boats and go, oh, God, we're going to be stuck for two weeks with a bunch of English. Oh, my God, they're Irish. Fantastic. We're going get, to get along like a house on fire. Um, and again, you get an issue of like Irish um, crew on ships warning them about what the English are really like. And then obviously they arrive in Liverpool and Scotland and then these rumours start spreading and circulating. So... It's, a, it's this weird kind of multifaceted thing that it's difficult to know exactly whether or not this happened, but everybody believed that it could. Okay, no, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Jeff, for your question there. Um, Angela, Angela Hall, you, you're actually unmuted and technically your video's showing. Right, uh, thank you, Chris, for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, with the, uh, the Black Americans, um, how were they recruited into the army? Because it can't have been a very attractive prospect for them, you know, due to the treatment of them. And also, were native North Americans recruited into the army? And were they treated any different to the um, Black Africans? So, uh, I mean, the opportunity to serve in the American army is actually quite appealing to um, African Americans because they have a feeling or a hope that by serving in a national effort and a national cause, they'll reap the benefits of it afterwards. So the opportunity to serve for their country means that their country will be grateful to them. Um, now, to be honest, the issue with that is that you can apply it to 
people within the British Empire as well, say for India, for example, the idea that, or, or even in Ireland, that service in the army will in some way lead to some form of national gratitude. Um, now, when the recruitment actually happens, so they, you know, they basically sign up and get drafted along with everybody else, but they do have notable differences to their immediate experience. So, for example, large numbers of African-American recruits in South Carolina um, have a delayed start to their training to ensure that they can finish the cotton harvest in the oh, area. Um, mm. So they, you know, they, they arrive two weeks later than everybody else to make sure that they finished being out in the fields and, and, and picking. Um, and there's ongoing issues with people around in towns around the army bases. And all, there's always kind of fears or rumours that black Americans are being lynched effectively. Um, with the Native American um, aspect, I'm not actually sure, um, to be honest, how many or the numbers of them that are recruited. Um, it's not something that I particularly looked into. Um, I don't think it happens in any huge numbers. I, I'm not aware of like uh, an overwhelming number of Native Americans serving within the um, United States Expeditionary Forces. I don't doubt that there are some, and probably for similar reasons, that service to the nation will result in some form of effectively electoral or social prize at the end of it. Um, but I'm not sure what, how big the numbers are or exactly what their treatment is. Again, probably not great, I would suspect, um, given how um, the Americans treated the African Americans. I don't imagine that Native Americans would have had a great time um, in the army, but they certainly don't get you know, shipped away to the French or anything like that. There's no, I'm, I'm not aware of that happening. Right. Okay, okay thank you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks for your question. Thank you. uh, um, Bridget Crompton, um, let me just um, ask you to start your video there. Uh, Richard, you're live. Your, your video's not live. Uh, there we are. We're live. I can see you and uh, we can hear you. Uh, fire away, Richard. Thank you, Chris. A, a fascinating new insight. Thank you. What's your opinion of the way Monash handled his attached but inexperienced and naive American Second Corps at Boney on the Hindenburg Line in September 1918? That's a good question. I thought um, it was as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, well, I, there, there's always a, a slight feeling when you, you start talking about Monash that as soon as you start saying anything, I, I start wondering how many emails I'm going to get from Australia. Um, but To be honest, I don't, I don't really, I don't really have a strong feeling one way or the other towards it. To be honest, um, I mean, he'd handled the Americans quite well at uh, La um yeah. when they were fairly inexperienced. Um, Manash knew how to win battles, which is, you know, always useful. Um, but beyond that, I've never really given it a great deal of thought. That's not, it's not a particularly good answer, I'm afraid, to simply say I haven't really thought about it. Um, but yeah, I think unfortunately that's kind of the answer. I don't really have a have a strong opinion. I don't, to be honest, I don't really have a strong opinion about Manash, um, which can also often be a, a safety mechanism when when discussing him. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I just I, I don't really have any any strong feelings. I'm afraid. Link, link, okay, link, link to link to that, uh, Chris. Richard, thanks for your question. Link okay. to that. Uh, there's another. A question which is uh, sidled in uh, just just here. Um, the Australians are alleged to or did have more spending power than the British. Yes. Uh, similarly, more spending power and uh, than the British and uh, the Australians. And did that have any kind of impact in in, in the relations as well? Yes. Um, so another book to maybe look at is uh, Craig Gibson's uh, Behind the Front which is about British uh, soldiers and French civilians. And there's an economic pecking order on the Western Front. The French get annoyed that as soon as the British arrive in town, all the prices get raised because the British have got all the money. The British get annoyed when the Australians arrive in town because all the prices get raised because they've got all the money. Um, and then the British are really annoyed when the Americans arrive because not only do they and the Australians get along just fine, the French civilians think they're amazing, but they still raise all the prices um, at the same time. And that does cause 
issues because certainly in the early years of the war, the British are quite, it's not, they're not shy of lording their economic power over everybody else, particularly the French and the Belgians. And a lot of French and Belgian soldiers at times write about what appears to be the, 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 the incredible wealth of this of, of Britain as a country and the incredible wealth of the British soldiers who have all of this money and they get all of these things sent from home and they get you know little gold boxes at Christmas filled with chocolate and stuff and where does all of this money come from yeah um and the British quite like that because it makes them feel great um and then the Americans arrive and they've got money and they've got a fanfare and it it just puts their nose out of joint but it's it's, a, it's, it's the exact thing that I said earlier it's new money they come in and they just start throwing this money around because they've got loads of it and they don't, don't care about how it used to be here. Uh, and it obviously has an inflationary effect on, on prices. Um, the, the, the French are obviously going to increase the prices to, to soak up the, uh, the the surplus cash that's available. Right, th th thanks for that, Chris. Um, James Hayday, let me just unmute you there. I'll ask you to unmute and um, I can't seem to invite you to start your video. I don't know if you've got a camcorder there or not, but James, are you able to um, unmute yourself there, James? Hello? James, Hello? can you hear you? You're, you're oh, live? Right, okay. Yeah, live? sorry, I, I, I haven't got a camera. Uh, it's just me. Uh, <laughs> no worries, no worries. You, you, you carry on, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just basically, I, I just asked that question, and I don't know if you're aware of it. It was, um, you know, it was a great talk and everything, but um, uh, I visited um, Compiègne uh, last year for the armistice train, and I went with a group of people, and we all went around the museum there, and as an observation, we all came out, not actually talking to one another until we all come out, and we all had the same feeling that France really portrayed itself as the overall victor of the war, and there was very little allied intervention or help. It was just the feeling I got, and also to rub insult into injury, was at the very end, you could see they were getting ready to do their... Um, big armistice uh, gathering and it was only going to be between France and Germany. So we were excluded, the Americans were excluded, New Zealand, India and everybody else that was involved were not included. It was just, yeah, a bit strange, I thought, anyway. Um, I don't know if you visited uh, Compiègne. I haven't. I have, I've wanted to go for a while. I, I mean, I have heard similar from it that, um, that the, the, the museum there does kind of herald the the, the the success and victory as as being fairly french um I, I very much want to go there i've always kind of been one of those things that i've always planned to go to but never actually gotten around to going so i'd quite like to go and, and, and take a look myself um in regards to the armistice aspect for the for the celebration or commemorations in 19 in 2018 um i'm not alone in um what's the best way of, of phrasing this within First World War history group to think that the First World War centenary got rather tied in with ongoing British European politics might be the, uh, the easiest way to suggest that relations between Britain and other countries in Europe um, regarding EU membership rather got in the way of aspects of the um, armistice celebrations in particular and other parts of the the commemorations during the centenary um and my understanding having spoken to people who were involved with organizing some of them was that it got very very difficult and it got very very complicated um and what we got was what we got really um but i would very much like to go to to Compania um and take a look at it because yeah i, I mean firstly i just want to go um but secondly it'd be interesting to to kind of see how I feel about it. Well, th thanks for that and thanks for your question there, James. Right, no Norman, uh, Norman Clark. Um, again, I uh, possibly can't get you to have a, uh, show your video. I suspect you haven't got a, a camcorder there, but if you, but Norman, if you want to just unmute yourself there. Okay, we're not, we're struggling there to get through to Norman. Rob Burkett, um, Rob, I'm gonna go to you next. Um, Rob, you live, um, if you want to find a way. Good evening, Chris. Um, your comments on uh, the monument or more in Calais, do you think it was, do you think it was a, a decision from the top down 
that, that led to the destruction of the monument? Or was this a little regional thing or a little spat on the part of the local people? How, how do you think that panned out? I really don't know. It's always been an interesting thing about, you know, who actually, you know, gives the order, who decided to, to destroy it? Was it, you know, was it destroyed in the fighting? Was it just destroyed or blown up afterwards as well? Has always been a, a slight question mark over it. My, my instinct, knowing that, like, the orders, what the orders were given for what was supposed to happen in Paris for the destruction of various memorials and monuments, is that my temptation is to say that it came from the top down. Um, but at the same time, things like, you know, the Vimy Ridge Memorial isn't, is, you know, is it basically effectively kind of turned into a, into a secluded, you, you know, mothballed piece, which is, which is kept safe during the, during the Second World War. Um, and um, that, that at times the Germans kind of left the First World War memorials alone. They didn't do, do it with all of them. Um, and particularly with the French ones, they were fairly unkeen on keeping them. And in fact, you know, if you think about Foch's railway car at Compania, um, definitely not keen on, on keeping that alive for any longer than was humanly necessary. So I don't really know who actually decided to destroy it and, and blow it up. My instinct would be that some it's come from above down. But at the same time, why bother? Why this memorial of all of them? Um, you know, it's hardly, you know, it's hardly keep fell, isn't it? Um, or, or, you know, the men in gate or, or anything, you know, more important, you know, it's a single monument in, in Cali without wanting to, um, without, you know, wanting to, to kind of talk it down. There's an element of who cares about, oh no, they destroyed the monument or more of Cali. The allied powers will never sleep again. Well, to be honest, I, I reckon they've probably got more important things. So I don't know, I could spin it either way, to be honest. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, it does. I mean, it just seemed to be that um, the, the Germans, particularly in the Second World War, uh, would pull down those that were uh, qu quite uh, aggressively anti-German, you know, things like foot on the eagle and that sort of thing. Yeah. Anything that was really provocative, it seems that they got rid of those pretty sharply. Yeah. But yeah, it does. It goes some way to answer it. But thank Super. you. Um. The, the, uh, we had a couple of questions for, for folk who couldn't get on, on board. So Norman Clark um, said, excellent talk. How did the Western Allies see or get on with the Russians and looking to the other side of the hill, the German relations with their allies um, appear um, poor? Is that so? That's a, I love that question. Absolutely love that question because the Russian example is so weird in regards to things. So um when she wrote about um allied relations elizabeth greenhall said there were two things that would guarantee good relations between allied soldiers proximity and success now that is true up to a point but uh french soldiers and british soldiers repeatedly throughout the first world war obviously up until you know 1917 um write about how great they think the Russians are and how wonderful the work they must be doing on the Eastern Front, this enormous Russian, you know, um, avalanche is going to sweep west and destroy the, destroy the Germans. I mean, obviously, we know that isn't going to happen, but it, it fits in with wider opinion about Russia at the time. But also, there is a wonderful book called With Snow on Their Boots by Jamie Cockfield, which deals with the Russian expeditionary forces um, who are sent to France basically sold for shells and rifles. The Russians have lots of men, the French need men, the French have lots of guns, the Russians need guns, and a trade is made. And these Russians come over and fight on the Western Front and have a very, very difficult time because the culture shock is so severe. Um, you know, not very many British soldiers spoke French, but at least they shared the same alphabet and, you know, a general understanding of Western Europe. The Russians don't have any of that. Um, so they end up incredibly isolated. And this feeling as well that the French will do what the Americans and the Australians thought the British would do to them, that the French will throw the Russians in first to save French lives. Um, then when the... Um, the revolution happens, um, the French basically quarantine 
these Russian expeditionary forces for fear that they're going to infect everyone around them with Bolshevikism. Um, and that this kind of re revolutionary fervor will radiate out into the, to the masses of French soldiers. I mean, given the activity around the Commende d'Arm, it might not necessarily be, you know, a, a naive fear from them. Um, so eventually the, the, the Russians just kind of get bottled up and, and then vaguely sent home when the opportunity arises. Um, there's, a, there's a historian who's studying at St Andrews at the moment called uh, Sofia uh, Anisimova, um, who works on the experience of Russian soldiers who stayed in France um, after the, the First World War. So her work is very much worth looking up. Regarding the Germans, the Germans have, with their allies, have both the best and worst of worlds for it. Now, they have the best of worlds because it's very clear who's in charge of the central powers. You know, what Germany says is going to happen is what Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, etc., are going to do. Um, because Germany is at the centre of that alliance. Whereas with the Entente Alliance, if, particularly in the early years, you've got Britain and France, both of whom are you know, great powers in their own right. They're not going to let the other one order them around. There's going to have to be some give and take. You know, the British are going to do what they're going to do. The French are going to do what they're going to do. And maybe there'll be some way to cooperate in the middle. But what that also means is that Germany is saddled with their allies. The, Germany is constantly having to drag them and prop them up and support them. Um, so one of the, the, the weird aspects of, say, the, the, the justification for the Gallipoli campaign, which was, oh, you know, if we, if we can knock out the Ottoman Empire, we'll knock the chocks and we'll knock the supports out from underneath Germany, is to fundamentally misunderstand how the central powers work. It's not Ottoman Empire propping Germany up, it's the other way around. Yeah. Germany is propping up all of its allies, which means as the war drags on, and starvation starts to set in, and bad morale starts to set in, and, and shortages of ammunition and supplies start to set in, Germany is constantly having to, to carry the load of it. They're having to supply the uh, Austro-Hungarians. They're having to supply the Ottomans, um, which means that there's, there's never anybody to, to take the load off. You know, the, the French don't have to really kind of keep the British fighting, and nor they really have to do the same with the Americans. Yes, it might end up that the Western, that the Entente Alliance is some kind of unwieldy, horrible committee meeting, but at the very least they're looking after themselves. There's no single responsibility to keep everybody else alive, which is the problem that Germany has. So eventually they just have to, they just have to bully them, they just have to bully their allies into doing what they want and drag them along for as long as they possibly can. Uh, super. Th thanks for that, Chris. And uh, thanks, Norman, for that question. Sorry you couldn't ask it in, in, in person, but hope that answered uh, uh, your excellent question there. Kurt, Kurt I'm going to just um, ask you to unmute yourself. Kurt, you're now live. Um, fire away. Well, thank you. And uh, Mr. Kempel, Kempshaw, excuse me, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, and what you were saying about uh, the Russian troops that served on the Western Front, I think it was something like two divisions, but in addition, uh, the Russians sent two, uh, two divisions, if I'm not mistaken, to the Salonika Front as well. But uh, earlier, somebody had asked about the American Indian experience in the American Army during this uh, First World War. Uh, I have to admit that I wasn't very knowledgeable on that, but I did a quick look, and it appears that uh, something on the order of about eleven to 12,000 uh, American Indian uh, uh, soldiers uh, were either drafted or uh, uh, volunteered, and it was about an even split between the two. But in terms of how they served, on con in contrast to the black soldiers who were segregated into separate units with white officers, the American Indians were integrated into uh, white units and served there. And one aspect that also came out of that was, if you're familiar with the Code Talker pro uh, issue that came up in the Second World War, largely in the Pacific Theater, it actually started in Western Europe in, uh, with American forces serving on the Western Front using uh, members of the Choctaw and the Cherokee tribes. And uh, they discovered they had these guys uh, you know, in their unit and hey, they speak a different language and the Germans aren't gonna know that. So well, let's use them. 
And that's what little I know. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Kurt. Um, Edward Green. Edward. Uh, you right. Um, Chris, thank you very much for that. Uh, you've answered a, a question that's bothered me for 20 years. A, a, an old veteran from my regiment uh, of the First World War, who'd just been awarded his Legion d'honneur, told me that an American had spat on his boots at Calais, and he'd hated the Americans for 80 years since. And I've often wondered why, and thank you for answering it. My actual <laughs> question is, um, I have never understood why the British, the Australians and the French don't celebrate Amiens as a great victory, um, almost on the lines of Waterloo or Trafalgar. Um, it just seems, in this country anyway, to have just disappeared. And I am just wondering if you have any ideas why. Um, that's a good question. I mean, there was stuff for it in 2018, because I, I seem to have I ended up having to do a variety of, of, of radio bits and pieces. I suspect the, the reason why there was stuff in 2018 was because Hugh Strawn rather insisted about it. Um, with regards to why they don't do it do more, I think there is a wider popular kind of misunderstanding about how and why the First World War ends. And I think a lot of people just kind of attribute it to eventual exhaustion, that everybody just kind of got tired, the Germans were the most tired, and everyone went home. Um, to an extent, rather than it's actually being, you know, it's a military victory. Um, you know, the Allies win the First World War, they smash the Germans on the Western Front, um, the German army is completely routed, the German army itself knows that it's lost, which is why they sue for peace. Um, but I think that it all kind of ties into a, a feeling that it's not a war that's won militarily, it's a war that ends through exhaustion. And I think that's probably why there isn't a great deal of excitement about it. I mean, also in regards to things like, if you compare it to Waterloo, you always have that issue of, you know, a First World War battle versus a 19th century battle in, you know, one took place in a day and one takes place over several days and then the war ends four months later. Um, that kind of aspect, you know, how decisive can it have been if there was still a quarter of the year to go? Which, you know, we all know rather misunderstands the nature of the warfare on the Western Front. Um, but yeah, I just don't, I don't think people interact or think of the First World War as a war that is being won. I think they think of it as a war that is being lost. Right, Th thanks. Thanks for that, Chris, and thanks for that question, Edward. Um, I, I think that's just about it, really. Um, I, I'm getting notifications that my internet is slightly unstable, so <laughs> I think it's probably best to uh, uh, quit whilst we're ahead on on, on on that one to a certain extent before before it goes up. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I, I feel um, entertained and also informed by, by what you, you've had to say. It's been a very interesting evening, very uh, excellent presentation. Chris, is there anything, I don't know if there's anything you want to sum, uh, sum up um, at all, but otherwise um, we, we'll um, probably uh, I, well tell you what. We'll, let's let's do the tradition. Um, everybody, and uh, I can see the, the hands uh, going up uh, merrily there, so uh, final round of applause, Chris. Uh, so thanks for that. Unless you've got any final observations, we'll probably call that, that an evening. No, uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming. I hope it was useful. I hope it was enjoyable and fun uh, and interesting. Um, yeah, if you want to, you know, if you want to buy a copy of the book, go ahead. Um, equally, if you don't, I entirely understand. Um, and have a nice rest of the evening and the week. Thanks very much indeed, Chris. Um, and yeah, this will be on YouTube uh, in, in a couple of weeks, but also on the WFA's Facebook, so you can pick up the details of the titles that uh, Chris has mentioned, and also obviously ha write down this uh, code at your leisure later. But uh, in summary, thanks everybody for watching, uh, but above all, thanks Chris for, for taking part and uh, educating us. Super. Good job. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Get it.